Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 715, I think. <laughs> My name is Camden Busey, I think. I'm in Grays Lake, Illinois, and uh, I'm excited to be back. I uh, have with me today Jim Cassidy, who's pastor of South Austin OPC in South Austin, Texas. Hey, Jim, how's it going? Are you sure that's who I am and where I'm from? I don't know. <laughs> Or do you think? <laughs> I've been in a different continent, so yeah, that this this is why it's uh, all hazy You're reorienting. For me. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm reacclimating. You know, my brain is still somewhat getting used to English again after being uh-huh. immersed in in the uh, Latin culture in Colombia. So it's been a good time. So I've been back for about a little, well, not quite, not two weeks, but a week and a half, and so I'm still trying to catch up with all sorts of projects and emails and requests and other things that have been looming and piling up as I was gone. I was uh, traveling in uh, Colombia, South America. I People are like, where are you going to travel? Or I'd say, I've been, I was in Colombia. They're like, I love South, South uh, Carolina. I'm like, no, not, <laughs> not Colombia with the <laughs> you, a different yeah. one. I was yeah. down in South America uh, with OPC Foreign Missions. Uh, I was there for 12 days total teaching uh, two conferences and uh, visiting two different churches in two different cities uh, on the Lord's Day with Doug Clausen, who is Associate General Secretary for Foreign Missions for the OPC. He also serves as a board member here at Reformed Forum. And uh, you've been down to Columbia with him too, haven't you? I have, yeah. It's been, if you could believe it, it's been two and a half years now um, mm-hmm. since since I was there and some very dear brethren uh there in in bogota that i had a chance to meet i know that you um you went to different places other than bogota i went to bogota uh, but yeah we did two spots Mm -hmm. yeah i was just in bogota so i only met the saints there but uh yeah uh dear dear brethren great church and doing really good ministry and work in that area and it was a pleasure uh to teach on on van till when i was down there that's amazing I, I can't say enough uh, about my my trip and uh, just getting to meet uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ down there and uh, participate just in worship. It was amazing just to go to two worship services, um, broaden my vision uh, of Christ's work and, and his kingdom, even though technically we're in the same time zone. I don't know if they call it the same time zone, but there's no adjustment from where I live near Chicago, uh, w- which relatively made that somewhat easy. I could call home and, you know, the, the, over the Wi-Fi and the hotel and whatnot. And there wasn't, you know, the kind of adjustment that there would have been if I went off to, to China for, or Australia or something. But um, just to be in a completely different type of culture, still very Western, still modern city. I mean, there are 10 million people in Bogota. And uh, to participate in that, uh, it, was, it was delightful and wonderful. But um yeah, it was it was kind of life changing, life shaping. I've only been outside the United States, well, technically two other times. Once, very briefly, my parents took me to Tijuana. That's another story uh, for a different day. <laughs> when I was two, I think they were on the run from the authorities or something. I'm going to get a text from my mom when she listens to this and correct me that uh, she's going to be upset that I cast aspersions on their <laughs> on their <laughs> legal record. Um, anyway, uh, and the other time, um, I think in 06, it was either 05 or 06, I traveled to Ukraine uh, to to visit to, to travel with uh, someone who was on the board of a seminary over there. So I was just kind of a tag along travel partner, and it was it was wonderful to be in a different continent and to communicate with other people and to visit a worship service in a different culture. So now, you know, being 41 years old, I get another trip uh, to get down to South America. I wish I would have done it a long time ago. How did you feel after making the trip and then coming home? Yeah, I wasn't gone nearly as long as you were. Uh, you were you were like a week and a half gone, yeah, I think. Yeah, almost two and, weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, so that's that takes a lot out of you. And uh, I was, I mean, I was tired. I was also invigorated. By many things, uh, of course, uh, had had a great time, had a blast um, and teaching and all of that. So it was probably three or four nights, you know, where you go to bed and you still are having your brain is still uh, in Colombia and you're still right. thinking about the people there and you're thinking, you know, so 
it was um, it was a, a you know you had to decompress I think over some time, but it was great. It was it was a joy, and I was welcomed. And uh, it's an absolutely beautiful country. And the food is amazing. Yes. Uh, so you know, it's when you go to a place like that, you're yes, you're, you're not you're not suffering. Uh, let's put it to you that right. way. You're not you're not out in the middle of the desert somewhere or uh, someplace where it's uh, poverty um, stricken or something. It's uh, uh, not saying there isn't poverty uh, poverty poverty in um, Colombia. There is, but um, the places where we were. It just was, you know, just so beautiful and, mm -hmm. and comfortable and the food was great. Coffee was awesome. So, yeah. yeah, I got to go to a coffee plantation, a cultivo, they call it, and see shade grown coffee under the Bucuro trees uh, on top of a mountain. So I was more than a mile high in elevation, you know, drinking coffee where it was grown. It's surreal. And then uh, in, in Bogota, I got to uh, go up to the to Montserrat, I, I imagine, I, I know you or, or Lane or both of you have been up there and that's 10,400 yep. foot elevation. So the city yep. of Bogota is 8,600 feet, which is high enough. Uh, I, you know, I was kind of half expecting in the morning on my, of my first full day to when I was running on the treadmill that I'd probably pass out, but I, I didn't, I survived. <laughs> uh, but uh, getting on top of that mountain and just looking down at the city was, I, I've never experienced anything like that. I mean, I come from land of 500 foot elevation and it's flat, you know, and to be on top, not just of a mountain like we might have in the United States, but 10,400 feet. And just with that climate and everything, just uh, green mountains too, not rocky mountains or just piles of rock, but just lush covered in vegetation and forest, even up to 10,400 feet and no snow. This is a bizarre, I mean, the Andes mountains is just something to behold. So I hope yeah. to go back sometime, but I should mention, uh, you know, we're going to have Doug Clausen on, uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll talk in more detail about what we're actually doing and what the strategy of the OPC foreign missions is and his history of involvement, not just in South America, but the, the OPC's involvement around the world. Doug heads up, uh, as part of his responsibility as associate general secretary heads up something called the mobile theological mentoring Corps, which in effect is. Uh, OPC foreign missions, uh, well, Doug and others will take perhaps, you know, a, a professor or instructor of some sort to a foreign mission field, and then they will teach on a subject uh, at a conference. So these conferences are typically organized and run by local churches uh, that are ideally organized into presbyteries. And uh, down the road, we hope that they would be organized into denominations that have ecumenical fellowship with the, with the the OPC and would in turn eventually send out their own missionaries to foreign missions fields. This is the goal. OPC missions is always trying to put itself out of business. So they don't we don't, you know, typically do anything like uh, direct funding of pastors or purchasing buildings this sort of thing, but we support uh, burgeoning churches, local churches into presbyteries into denominations. Uh, helping them along the way in their maturation. And one way that we do that is by sending uh, qualified instructors to teach on subjects and topics that are beneficial not only to lay people, but also to uh, pastors in these countries. Uh, so I was down there and taught two different conferences uh, uh, on two different weekends. Uh, the first, I was up in the north. I should say Douglas uh, has contact with Reformed Christians and established relationships with people in Bogota, Medellin, Cartagena, Barranquilla, Pasto, Bucaramanga. There, there are people, Reformed people in all of these areas of which he's had contact with. And um, it's been very encouraging to see these brothers come together and to organize, not just as people who appreciate Reformed stuff because it's something that's available, but people that are self-consciously reformed and confessional subscribing to, you know, a, a version of the Westminster standards uh, for their language and seeking to develop, you know, a, a reformed polity and a, and a reformed, um, you know, organized denomination in ecumenical fellowship and, and hopefully sending people to serve as, a, you know, ecumenical um, correspondence to other denominations. So I was down there teaching the first weekend in the north on uh, modern Roman Catholicism and the uh, Reformation today. So we'll cover some of that material here after 
we get uh, done with this more introductory stuff. And then down in Bogota, I taught uh, a, a, a series of lessons, a conference for the lay people on Lamentations, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah using the material from uh, the Bible study book I wrote with Crossway. Both were tremendous. Uh, last year in March, I was supposed to go down to Bogota, but uh, got canceled due to COVID. At least my trip got canceled, and I taught remotely through Zoom in Bogota the material on modern Roman Catholicism and the Reformation. So going down there and seeing the people was so much uh, better. I, I love doing it through Zoom. I was happy for that opportunity, but to be able to communicate with people and spend a week with them, it, it was unparalleled. It doesn't even compare. So what did you teach when you were down there in, in Bogota, Jim? Yeah, I was talk, uh, teaching on Van Til's apologetic and um, trying to situate Van Til within his theological commitments. Was this for pastors, I presume? Uh, it, it was, I think it was, I think I forget if it was a, I think it was a pastor's conference. It wasn't necessarily for, for lay people. Yeah. Uh, although there were lay people there, but, um, yeah, I think if I recall correctly, Doug wanted it at a, you know, more seminary level or whatever. So, mm -hmm. so I introduced Van Til's, uh, life and then went through some of the basic, um, theological commitments that he has and how that gives rise to his apologetic method. Yeah. Well, they're eating it up. Uh, I was talking to one brother uh, from Pasto who said Van Til is one of his favorites, and he's just itching for Spanish translations of Van Til, which is something we have our eye on doing or helping with, at least with, with the OP. So there's a lot of great stuff coming along. And this, of course, fits in with our overall mission of what we're trying to do at Reformed Forum where we're seeking to support the church and her charge of, of uh, presenting every person mature in Christ. And this isn't just for Americans or for English-speaking peoples. So one big way that we do that and have been working on for the last year, year and a half, is through Reformed Academy, which of course is a section of our website where you can go and sign up for free and take video courses. Uh, not just watch the videos, but it'll track your progress. You can take quizzes. You could use them in the, in the setting of a of an adult Sunday school or in a small group study. Uh, there are all sorts of ways in which people are using. I just looked today and we're getting close to 3,500 students now uh, and at least 66 countries. We might have received our, six, our 67th country, a student from our 67th country soon. I'll have to check that count a little bit later. But we, we have been working hard not only to produce courses, but to get them translated. And uh, with the generous support of a lot of our listeners and viewers, people that have donated, uh, we've been able to translate uh, a whole bunch of courses into Spanish. And uh, I was going to uh, teach my introduction to covenant theology originally in Bogota. That was the plan. Uh, was, uh, I was supposed to go to India, but then that trip got canceled because of the COVID break uh, out or uh, uptick in India. So we quickly rescheduled and went to Colombia. So then uh, the thought was, oh, what, what am I going to teach? And I was like, well, I've got this course on Intro to Covenant Theology. So that I sat on that and was preparing to teach for that for about a week. And then they finally came back and, and said something to the effect of, well, we don't, we don't <laughs> we want you to teach something else. Part of the reason was a lot of their people have already taken the course <laughs> through the Internet. So um, because they, they're, I can go in and see. They, we have tons of, of students in Colombia, which is tremendous. It's encouraging that they've been able to, to watch these videos and follow along and learn things. So, uh, you know, we're trying to put the pedal to the metal, so to speak, and produce more courses and get more and more translated into not just Latin Spanish, but also simplified Chinese and prioritizing other languages where we have established relationships with indigenous churches in what, from our perspective, what are foreign mission fields. So it's, it's working. I mean, we're not pragmatists, but we see the Lord's hand at work, even just empirically. I, we can look at the numbers and see there's tons of students. And so that's been encouraging to me, but then also to go and visit and see people, to meet people, to hug people in person, people that have been engaged in using these resources. They're not just numbers on the internet, but people with names, faces, with stories, with with a vibrant faith in Christ that you can connect with. It's really, it's really remarkable. I agree. It's, uh, it's humbling to, to see the Lord move and to, uh, and to use us in this way. 
it's encouraging, uh, but it's also humbling because it just all the more accents the stewardship that we have at Reform Forum, and it's a big responsibility, right? Because we're not we're not ministering to just a handful of people here in America, but uh, we have a, a ministry uh, where we have a responsibility to serve um, God's people throughout the world, and uh, right. that's a a heavy duty responsibility. That also comes back to our our vision of the parachurch and uh, you know proper church government and polity, which is why we partner with groups like the OPC Foreign Missions. We're not trying to do the work of the missionary directly as an organization. Now, you and I are both ministers of the gospel. We're called to evangelize and to teach as part of our vows to the church, which in the context in foreign missions would involve doing you know, mission work, but we're not trying to establish those relationships or to to partner directly with indigenous churches in foreign fields as Reform Forum, so to speak, but for Reform Forum to enable our faculty and others to serve through the OPC and, and potentially through several other organizations and, and ministries that would have these established relationships. It's a much, I think, a much more robust ecumenical view and also one that uh, provides for proper church polity and accountability uh, and allows Reform Forum to assist the church rather than replace the church. So anyway, th- those are some things that I thought would be useful. I don't want this to become, you know, the inside baseball talk. If you'd like for us to talk more about this or, or perhaps we can have a Q&A session, we could have a you know, a live stream or something to let people call in and, or and ask their questions and be happy to talk all day, all night about these types of things that get me excited. But I realize we need to get to some material here. So look forward to some future episodes with Doug Clawson on OPC foreign missions and particular strategy and theology of missions and how we engage in those things. If you got some particular questions about Columbia and uh, what's going on down there, you can Write us a note at mail at reformedforum.org or if you'd be curious on how to help or volunteer or if there are any short-term missions opportunities, uh, send send those emails on over to us and we'll dispatch them to the appropriate place. But to get into the material, so to speak, uh, that many of you probably saw in the title and are expecting us to discuss, uh, we'll, we're going to speak today about the influence of modernism. Looking at uh, one of my lectures and some of the material uh, in my course on modern Roman Catholicism and the Reformation, I'm trying to update our view. I think that a lot of Reformed people have an outdated view of Roman Catholicism that's probably from 500 years ago when the Reformation occurred. But even then, sometimes the, the average person might even have a caricatured view that is 500 years old. So not only is it old and outdated, so to speak, but it might have been a caricature to begin with. So it's helpful to understand, uh, you know, Rome's positions, and also to understand the different positions within Rome and the and the changes that have occurred to uh, the Roman Catholic Church over the last five hundred plus years, and understand how the Reformation and the principles of the Reformation apply to those developments. Uh, you know, my goal and my intent, and certainly my conclusions at the end of the course, are not that. Uh, there, there needs to be some rapprochement between Rome and the Reformation, that the Reformation is no longer significant or important, but rather that the, the principles of the Reformation, especially the, so, the five solas, and, uh, are, are more significant and more important today than perhaps they even were back in 1517. Uh, but what's interesting is when we zoom in on the history, looking specifically at the early 20th century, we start to see uh, the changing, uh, you know, tides in culture. Modernism comes in, and it affected not just theology, but it affected industry. It affected uh, you know, secular philosophy. It affected art and culture in a whole host of ways. And it certainly had an effect not only on American Presbyterianism, as many of us are familiar with, with the modernist fundamentalist debates, but also had an effect on Roman Catholicism. And uh, paralleling those two, I think, is really interesting and insightful. Jim, do you know about much of this stuff or, uh, you know, typically, at least in my experience, you know, I came to seminary and I didn't come from a liberal arts background. I, I was a bachelor of science and did a, ended up doing a business and com- computer kind of hybrid degree in college and had to take my gen eds 
but uh, discussing modernism and postmodernism were generally not things that I did in, in at university. What about you at St. Anselm? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I was a yeah I was a philosophy major uh, in college, and so um, my the curriculum that we had was a very helpful one that laid out a history of philosophy. So you took the history of philosophy over the course of four courses, I guess. Yes, it was. And then on top of that, you had focused uh, studies topically. So a class on metaphysics and epistemology or what have you. And then uh, and then in addition to that, you would have uh, specialized classes. Uh, so you can take classes uh, in Thomas Aquinas, for example, was a popular class because at a Catholic college, the number sure. of the faculty there were uh, specialists and, and Thomas. That was he was the 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 big one there on campus. And so as it were, uh, yeah, yeah. And so, um, the, uh, but then I was able to get a really good, in addition to that sense of, of modern philosophy. And that was interesting, of course. So yeah, we, we were having conversations along those lines and, uh, modernism is a, you know, very distinct uh, time within Western intellectual thought, most broadly, and uh, how that relates, though, to Catholicism is something that I'm mostly ignorant about. And uh, that's where we could really learn from you. Uh, the, the the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, century developments in Roman Catholicism is something that, you know, I, I don't have an academic understanding of. Uh, in the sense that I grew up in in 20th century, late 20th century Roman Catholicism gives me an existential kind of insight into modern uh, right. Catholicism, but I don't have the academic um, insights. To no, but you are uh, experientially an expert in how the Rosary and the Our Fathers relate to the performance of the Mets and the Giants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the the harder I prayed the rosary, uh, the, the worse the Mets got, and so I took that as as being the fact that the Mets are are the Protestant team. It's the most powerful apologetic yet. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I've told you my theory, right? Uh, that the that that the that the Mets are the OPC version of New York baseball sports. And uh, that's, that's because uh, we're, we're sort of the lovable losers. Uh, we are the ones who are sort of the, the second team in the city and uh, but, but faithful and passionate and uh, committed to all the right things. Yeah. Well, I may dispute about half of what you said right there, but I can, <laughs> I can, uh, I could appreciate some, some of that. Uh, and I, I just, I at least need to make note that lovable losers is a trademark of the Chicago Cubs, we should say, but uh, at least it ought to be. Um, yeah. I'm no expert on modernism in 20th century Catholicism, but I have done significant amount of reading there and especially on my uh, doctoral work on Carl Rahner he's right in the mix of it and I'm doing some um, some work and research right now on uh, nature and grace in 20th century Catholicism in advance of our reform forum conference which is coming up at the beginning of October right near you Jim and in Pflugerville Texas so if anyone's listening would like to come on over to Texas uh, we'd love to see you. You can register for that at reformedforum.org slash conference. So we won't get too much into Nature and Grace. We might have an episode on that uh, at some point after I uh, nail a few things down in my research. But, I mean, at least as Presbyterians, we typically speak of modernism and fundamentalism from the perspective of uh, of the Presbyterian side of things, and there's a lot to be said there. But there are parallel developments in Roman Catholicism, which I think are quite instructive for us. And, you know, obviously in, in the grand scheme of world Christian history, uh, American Presbyterianism is a tiny sliver compared to what was going on in Rome. So, you know, even though this is more familiar, the American Presbyterianism is more familiar history to you and to me and to many of our listeners. And we hear of the modernist fundamentalist debates or, or you know, controversy. We, we, everyone, that's been around for any length of time knows at least the broad sketch of that history. Well, I mean, the world doesn't. So <laughs> we want to at least get the perspective right. Uh, it might be more appropriate to say that uh, American Presbyterianism, the mainline Presbyterianism, 
uh, paralleled Catholicism rather than the other way around, but people can get my my point. So um, modernism really was a development that flowed out of the Enlightenment, which itself was a, an 18th century culture movement away from tradition, faith, and revelation, of course. And uh, after the Enlightenment, a lot of people started to place a real huge emphasis on human reason. So this is some like Civ 101 type stuff, Western Civ. Uh, and this rediscovery of man's natural ability led to a number of different theological positions. It had an effect on everything, industry, culture, art, I said, but it had a huge effect upon theology. And we certainly don't have uh, time today to explore all these developments in philosophy and, the and theology, but at least I want to take a moment to focus on the significant movement uh, in Catholicism and uh, the Reformation uh, from pre-modern times through modernism and its battles, and then what happened in the 20th century after the church was forced to reckon with these modernistic tendencies. So, I don't know. What would you say, Jim, in terms of your experience with BART regarding modernism? Because in large measure, the American Presbyterianism solved, quote unquote, solved its problem with modernism by turning to BART. Liberalism is to BART what modernism is to postmodernism. And it's a movement, of course, Bartianism is a movement that takes place around the same time as you're sort of moving into more postmodern philosophy and approaches to literature, art, et cetera, early 20th century. And so uh, when, when, you approach, when you approach Bart, uh, it's oftentimes perceived that he is an alternative to modernism. And I don't think that that's accurate. I think that I don't want to downplay the differences between BART and liberalism, classical liberalism, at least. For sure. Uh, but at the same time, uh, liberalism in the vein of uh, von Harnack and uh, and then BART's theology are, are, are different variations on the same theme. I mean, it's the it's it's the same structural program. Uh, at its most basic uh, level. And so I see Bardianism and, and liberalism as, as siblings within the same family. Uh, Bart doesn't solve liberalism. He, he is liberalism taken to its next logical conclusion. Um, and so you're right, when, when Presbyterianism in this country was looking for sort of like, well, we don't want to be fundamentalists and we don't really want to be liberals. What about Bart? I mean, he's sort of, uh, well, he's a, he's neo-orthodox, which was the moniker given to him and his ilk back in the day. Uh, not really an appropriate moniker, especially in light of uh, today's research. But I think that they saw Bart as sort of a middle road uh, he's he's more orthodox than the liberals, but he's not as liberal as they are. And, and certainly he's much more um, contemporary and hip and with yeah. it, um, particularly with regard to modern uh, theological research than fundamentalism is. And we don't want to go that direction either. So so Princeton Seminary uh, went almost immediately from reorganizing its board along modernist lines to to the days of uh, of of hiring John Mackay and and others, uh, Emil Bruner came in around in the in the 30s as a um, as a uh, temporary research professor and et cetera. So um, they sort of never really went the the, the West uh, Princeton's faculty never went liberal. It just it sort of skipped that whole part yeah. and went from fundamentalism to Bardianism. Yeah, I've been doing uh, quite a bit of work on Ned Stonehouse as well. Part of my uh, responsibilities as OPC historian now. So, I mean, I haven't been assigned to do work on Stonehouse, but it's a project I'm I'm taking up. So I've been reading all of Stonehouse's contributions to the Presbyterian Guardian, uh, maybe with a view of a project down the road. But just doing that and familiarizing myself with the uh, the times and and reading about McKay, you know, the movement from J. Ross Stevenson to to McKay, um, 
and and the shifts. They certainly did go Bardian very early. They never were full out just classic liberals, but uh, at the same time, they weren't fundamentalists. <laughs> you know, modernism. Uh, we got to get some terms here in order for people uh, who may not know. So, uh, you know, check uh, that your podcast, either YouTube or your podcast, has chapter markers. I, I include chapter markers now in all the episodes of Christ the Center. And you'll see them on YouTube as well. So if you ever want to skip around, you can skip things uh, and uh, jump to different portions of the podcast. So getting some terms uh, correct, you know, modernism really rejected the certainty of enlightenment thinking and the existence of an all-powerful creator God in favor of an abstract ethic. And the world at the time was in transition and the changes in technology and industry led to large-scale shifts in a secular worldview. So this is what's at stake here. This is what's going on. And these shifts were not only exacerbated by the terrible events of World War I, uh, but in theology, modernism was a reworking of traditional theological doctrines according to 19th and early 20th century modes of thinking. And so at least for our concerns today, modernism is really bound up with liberalism. They might not be identical, but they're bound together. And uh, whenever we talk about J. Gressa Machen, Machen Horn, uh, uh, you know, uh, give a tip of the hat to the Presby cast there. But whenever we're talking about Machen or the founding of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, we use the word liberalism quite a bit. Uh, and Machen's most famous book, perhaps, was, of course, Christianity and Liberalism. Oddly enough, or not oddly enough, but uh, uh, Van Til's second book on Bart was uh, Christianity and Bartianism for the very same reasons. But when we hear the word liberalism and liberal, even outside the walls of the OPC, uh, we don't always know what we're talking about. Uh, people often speak of ideas that are liberal when really all they mean is that they are ideas that stray from biblical teaching. And in that perspective, at least uh, a lot of the Catholic Church, uh, Protestantism and uh, even parts of evangelicalism are very liberal. <laughs> but theological liberalism and modernism in the early 20th century was a specific theological movement that had a number of troubling features. So there's a more specific, technical, historical way to speak of classic liberalism that we want to talk about. And modernism swayed many people, had a great impact on both the Catholic and the Protestant churches. But to try to fight off that advancing liberal theology, there were were conservative Presbyterians who formulated five uh, fundamentals uh, that were to be used in addition to the Westminster Standards. Is this all sounding familiar to you, Jim? So, uh, perhaps some uh, some history lessons from seminary and uh, your licensure exams, or at least your ordination exams? Yeah, I, I didn't do so great on those. So, but yeah, anyway, yeah, it's uh, starting to come back to me now. I've learned I've learned more after seminary than I did before it. Yeah, well, I mean, the thumbnail sketch is that there were people who were modernists who said that they subscribed to the Westminster Standards, but the, in effect, they didn't. They didn't subscribe ex animo from the heart, or they subscribed to them as valid theories, but not exclusive theories. Uh, you know, they had all sorts of other ways to, you know, subscribe to the standards without actually believing them the way that, you know, conservatives thought everyone was supposed to believe them. And so people uh, formulated five fundamentals. Uh, They were the inspiration of the Bible and the inerrancy of Scripture as a result of that. There's the virgin birth of Christ. Uh, There's the belief that Christ's death was an atonement for sin. The bodily resurrection of Christ, kind of important. And then there's also the historical reality of Christ's miracles. So, People were, you know, opposed to these somewhat, and and some people thought that you shouldn't add to the confession because the confession says what it needs to say. Other people thought it wasn't; these weren't specific enough. Other people, uh, the Auburn Affirmationists, agreed with these five fundamentals, but didn't think they should be exclusive. They said, "No, we we believe these, we agree with these, but we think the church should be broad enough for people who have other theories." you know, of the atonement, for example, or maybe don't believe that Christ was born of a virgin, etc. But, you know, uh, of course, our listeners here, I hope, uh, will agree that each of these points of doctrine are at least extremely important and significant. And if we reject any of them, it would necessarily mean disastrous effects for sound theology. And in Presbyterian history, the greatest example of the fight against modernism came to a head in 1929, And that year, the board at Princeton Seminary, as you already indicated, Jim, decided to reorganize in such a way that the majority of people on the board 
were then modernists, or at least sympathetic to modernism. And the opponents of modernism at the time were called fundamentalists because they would agree with these five fundamentals or the series of fundamentals that was written in a publication at the time. And along with their de facto leader, J. Gresson Machen, they broke off from the seminary to found Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, where you and I, of course, both graduated. Would it be helpful for us to to put it this way, if we were to describe liberalism in a nutshell, the way the way that you were defining it, that it's a in the area of of religion, okay, or yeah, just most broadly religion, uh, liberalism or modernism in in the sphere of religion uh, basically carries with it this idea of a broadening, right? Sort of a an a, 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 an inclusive inclusivism, right? Where um, where there is a, a a broadening of both mind of doctrine of inclusion within the church, subscription vows, approaches to the standards, etc., um, that allow more underneath the umbrella. Would that be a fair way to summarize it? I think that's an effect. I don't know if that's uh, you know modernism. You know that's that would be a, the actual definition that we might want to use, but that's certainly what happened. My point is there might be other movements that have similar effects that weren't exactly modernistic, but I think the modernism that was affecting the culture and uh, eschewing traditional notions about God in favor of you know reinterpreting the Bible according to ethics, for example, rather than history. It's not a supernatural, uh, you know, God acting with supernatural effects in time and space, but rather the Bible being a record of human experience, you know, of the divine rather than a record of God's interactions <laughs> with humanity. Um, that's more or less, you know, the type of modernism that I see at work, the people wanting to make room for that, whether they agreed with it entirely or not. Uh, people in the modernistic constellation we're certainly uh, making room for people to hold those views. That was very common. Like we're reading these these things. Uh, the Presbyterian Church in the USA, the mainline church at the time, uh, you know, Stonehouse has some wonderful articles. Not only they addressed uh, modernism in the Board of Foreign Missions, but Stonehouse goes and starts to critique modernism in the the Board of Christian Education and starts to they start to review the books that they recommend highly recommend like for candidates of the ministry and even for like high schoolers and this sort of thing these are just full blown modernist books like people you know just completely like would even potentially not even agree to the resurrection of Christ bodily like <laughs> and these are not not just allowed but they were recommended by the Christ, the board of christian education of the denomination so we need to get our minds around this like this is what Presbyterianism was in the early 20th century. It was wild yeah, and um, yeah. unbelieving. Large portions of it just unbelieving. It's nuts. Yeah. It, not just kind of pushing the edges of, of culture and whatnot, but, uh, you know, th this is what we're, we're dealing with back, you know, 100 years ago. It's uh, unbelievable. You know, the theological Wild West. Yeah. <clears throat> it was. And, uh, you know, fast forwarding several years in 1936. Um, uh, Machen and others, for various reasons we can get into another time, uh, founded uh, the Presbyterian Church of America, which eventually came to be known as the the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in 1938, I believe, founded in 36, changed its name because it got sued by the main line and they didn't have enough money to, to, uh, to fight it. Um, eventually, uh, created a, another church. And uh, we ended up with the fundamentalists, so to speak, um, and all those people that were opposed to modernism and liberalism um, breaking off. And it was a small movement. There were a lot of relative conservatives, people, soft middle people who stayed in the main line. Uh, but uh, a handful broke off and formed the OPC. But uh, for people like you and me, that's kind of uh, where we end our history. We tend to think of that being, you know, the sum total <laughs> of modernism's effect upon the church. Uh, but there's a huge history uh, of modernism in Roman Catholicism, of which I was completely unaware until I started looking more into uh, into uh, Karl Rahner and other things. You know, um, there were several theologians uh, who started to write pieces and to teach modernist theology within the Roman Catholic Church. And that prompted a response from the Pope 
Uh, people may be surprised to know that Pope Pius X instituted an anti-modernist oath in 1910. So just parallel that with what's going on in Presbyterianism. In 1910, the Pope issued an anti-modernist oath and he ordered that all clergy, pastors, confessors, preachers, religious superiors, and professors in philosophical theological seminaries subscribe to this oath. In effect, denouncing modernism, saying that they're not modernists and denouncing it. And by doing that, he really institutionalized an anti-modernist position. And since Catholic theologians then could not be modernists, our, our, our uh, conclusion might be, oh, well, then they must have been fundamentalists. <laughs> no, that is not how it works. <laughs> now, in Catholicism, they were forbidden by the Pope, in effect, of being a modernist, but that doesn't mean that, that they became fundamentalists or, you know, theological conservatives. Um, certainly not. Um, we want to think of modernism and liberalism as specific theological movements during this time period. But even though the Catholic Church was officially against modernism, they did not move closer toward Protestant fundamentalists. So what happened? Well, that's where we get into the interesting history. Uh, before Pius X issued the anti-modernist oath, Pope Leo XIII established the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas as the official position of the Roman Catholic Church. That was in 1879. And consequently then, for several decades, it was practically impossible to find a Catholic theologian in good standing who would not call himself a Thomist, because they had to be Thomists, because that was the official philosophy of the church. But there were many, may we say, creative Catholic theologians who officially have to be Thomists, but yet they might reinterpret traditional Catholic teaching in light of various other philosophies. And there were theologians such as uh, Joseph Marshall, Karl Rahner, and Bernard Lonergan, who ended up reinterpreting Thomas Aquinas in light of philosophers such as Immanuel Kant. And that new philosophy, this hybrid, could still exist under the brand name of Thomism, but in effect, it's really no Thomism at all. It's kind of this, I don't know, Frankenstein, but it's a hybrid, a transcendental Thomism that refashioned Aquinas without, at least on the surface, transgressing Leo XIII's Declaration of 1879 or Pius X's anti-modernist oath. Jim, this is kind of what I end up calling the both-and phenomena in Catholicism. Very rarely do you see either or. Sometimes you see those anathemas like at Trent, <laughs> but generally it's not either or, it's both and. It's always, okay, we find two things that are contradictory, but rather than eliminating one part or half of the church who may agree with one portion, they, they tend to find a way to keep everything under the umbrella. And theologians who may be forced into a certain type of position tend to find a creative way to maintain the position they would like under the at least superficial banner of whatever is official. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's the, it's the Kant Aristotle synthesis, right? In some ways. Um, yeah, it is. You know, I wonder, I mean, this is a question I have because as, as you're thinking, I mean, when, when you sort of, uh, source Kant as a Roman Catholic, I would think that there would be some Catholics of a more conservative stripe who would look at that and, and say, I don't know how much of that would be, Hey, that's modern thinking and modern thinking is not good. Or is it Protestant thinking and Protestant thinking is not good because Kant sort of the, the Protestant um, Thomas, right? I mean, he's the philosopher theologian of, of the, of Lutheranism, uh, in, in the modern period. And so I wonder how many Catholics would see people who were compromised, you know, trying to rehash Thomas in, in Kant categories as being a, a, a compromise with Protestantism. Yeah. Well, I have spoken with some very well, you know, accomplished Catholic scholars who are conservative uh, and despise, uh, have great disdain for the theology of Rahner and other people like that. 
and just don't find it, not only they find it unbiblical, but even, you know, out of step with Catholic traditional thought and theology. But this is, this is the issue with Catholicism. With last I checked, I don't know what it's like in the last several years, but at one point, you know, officially on the rolls, we're about 1.2 billion Catholics. And, okay, put, put 1.2 billion people in the room, you're going to find a breadth of views. If you, if you think that evangelicalism is a useless term because it's too broad and diverse, oh, just, just wait till you, uh, you know, lift the rock up and look at what's underneath Roman Catholicism. It's even more so. I'm, I mean, I'd be happy to engage with Catholic scholars, but I've been struggling over the last couple of years to see, you know, at the end of the day, what makes a, a Catholic a Catholic? And, and it's hard for me to get around the, just the baseline bottom core commitment being fellowship with the Bishop of Rome. I don't, I don't, I, I think that is the fundamental core belief or commitment. Maybe I'm there, wrong. I'd love to hear otherwise, but that's, that is the sine qua non of a Roman Catholic. I, and there, you know, I guess there's, um, and everything else is a free for all. I mean, really. Quite frankly. Right. There are I, things I, that are out of bounds. I mean, the, the Pope and, and others, people have been censored. People have been excommunicated. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but you're right. I mean, it's, it, 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 it is largely a free-for-all. And people, Protestants who, you know, uh, swim the Tiber and, and want to go back to Rome uh, or go to Rome, uh, they, they have this vision that Rome is some unified monolith that has this uh, rich history and has been standing firm in their same beliefs for ages and ages. It's just not true. Yeah. The, um, even as a, as a Roman Catholic growing up, I witnessed liturgically things across the spectrum. You've got very traditional stayed worship but masses, um, they don't call them worship services, um, very staid masses that are very traditional, very liturgical, very formal, stuffy even. And then you have others that are on the opposite side of that charismatic. I mean, quite, I mean, there is a charismatic movement within Catholicism as well. Uh, so I, I just, I just find it interesting. I, I can't help but to think that, that Protestant, and I don't know why, but but Protestantism in the most broad sense of the word has not gone completely without its influence upon modern Roman Catholicism, mm. uh, whether it's theologically, culturally, liturgically, what sure. have you. There's crosstalk. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's so much of that. But of course, as, as much of a hodgepodge as modern Catholicism is uh, similarly, you find within Protestantism as well, uh, just a, um, really a hodgepodge we in the opc are are pretty tight but uh what, what are we thirty thousand compared to 1.2 billion uh you know we're just a insignificant drop in the bucket in the earthly sense of the word i know so, i know there's probably been more more mets players in history than opc members <laughs> yeah i don't know how many that they've had since 1962 but, there's probably uh, been more mets on the on the dl than the <laughs> Yeah, well, this year, this year, there's been more more Mets on the IL, uh, to be politically correct. Um, then right. uh, I forget. Then yeah, there I'm have old been school members over of here. the OPC. Anyway, What's that? I'm old school over here. Disabled yeah. list. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So anyway, what happened then? How did Catholicism deal with this? And this is where we get yeah. more interesting to compare Catholicism and, and uh, mainline Protestantism, specifically Presbyterianism. But the Catholic Church... Of course, if you know much about church history at all, it underwent significant changes in the 1960s. I mean, the United States did, but Catholicism did globally. In 1962, Pope John uh, XXIII brought many Catholic officials and theologians together to rethink Catholic doctrine on a whole host of issues, and they underwent a project of aggiornamento, which is an Italian word that means updating. And so it has been said that they wanted to uh, open the windows of the church to let fresh air in. And under the uh, leadership of John the Twenty Third, and later then Paul the Sixth, uh, the Second Vatican Council met from 1962 to 1965 to work out that uh, updating plan. And Vatican II, as a ecumenical council 
of which we weren't invited, but an ecumenical council uh, set out an aggressive agenda to update the church, the Roman Catholic Church, for a contemporary setting. And I think it was successful in that regard, at least. It changed quite a bit. In its wake, uh, the anti-modernist oath was dropped in 1967. That's huge. So they got rid of it. And the tenor of the magisterium, or the, at least the tenor of the, the officials, I should say, quickly changed. And during the council, uh, the once uh, nascent transcendental theology, figures like Lonergan, uh, Rahner, Marshall, and others, it started to grow firm roots and become much more established. And figures like Rahner, who were looked upon with suspicion by uh, the church earlier, even just prior to the council's commencement, now became its foremost authorities. Uh, Rahner was uh, on the uh, censored list before the council, and then at the council he was invited to come as an expert and became uh, what one person said, uh, the Holy Ghost writer of Vatican II. <laughs> as his influence, his uh, mysterious influence was upon all the constitutions and, and uh, uh, all of the, the resolutions. And really what happened is uh, post-Vatican II, to many the Roman Catholic Church had been turned upside down uh, historical theologians were left and still are left to sort out the relationship between the Rome of yesterday and its uh, instantiation in this latter half of the 20th century. Uh, the Council, if you don't know, produced several documents and dogmatic constitutions. Uh, they presented new theological constructions that significantly changed the Catholic Church's official views on a number of issues. Uh, some of these covering the doctrine of revelation, the liturgy. That's one a lot of old timers will remember because then you could have the the liturgy, the mass could be said in the vernacular, not just in Latin. That was a huge change. Uh, they updated Rome's relation to other Christian bodies and uh, even to world religions. And to summarize a lot of these these movements in just a few sentences, we might say that there was a general inclusive or ecumenical movement because after Vatican II, the Catholic Church recognized grace in other religions and even in the world in general. And so there was now a road that may, uh, was made for a reunion with the Eastern Church, but potentially even with Protestants and even people of other faiths that could be included under one massive Catholic umbrella. The theological equipment was installed, so to speak, to make this possible. And these are all important questions that, you know, remain to be answered for the Roman Catholic Church and people in, in Roman Catholicism are hashing these things out still. And, uh, you know, we can explore a lot of these things down the road, but um, to kind of look at these sweeping changes uh, from our, our modernist fundamentalist perspective, in one sense, you know, the creativity of progressive Catholic theologians has made the Catholic theological umbrella so broad that it's virtually non-distinct. And those are just several reasons why many people think that the Catholic Church post-Vatican II is incredibly different from the Catholic Church that Luther and Calvin knew. But that certainly does not make it any closer to Reformation theology. Uh, so we can look and see modernism, and you have an anti-modern, you have the official indoctrination or, or the uh, installment of Thomas Aquinas's philosophy is the official philosophy of the Roman Catholic Church in 1879, the anti-modernist oath established in 1910, but then all sorts of social and theological forces pressing upon the church, forcing it to update its views, leading to Vatican II and all of the dogmatic constitutions and documents coming out of Vatican II, which in many ways completely change the Catholic Church's position to the world. What happened in mainline Protestantism? And this is what I think is really interesting. Because in short, Protestantism in general did not fare much better, and it had similar effects, similar changes. And though its significance in terms of pure members is rapidly decreasing, the mainline churches such as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA, or the United Methodist Church, soon to split in half, and the Presbyterian Church USA remain some of the largest Protestant bodies. But mainline Protestantism suffered the effects of these doctrines as well. They struggled with the same basic issues as Rome, especially with the doctrine of Scripture. And the, the PCUSA in particular reacted against the modernism that plagued Princeton Seminary and many other large Christian bodies in the early 20th century. But instead of following Machen, and they, they battled against Machen, and they were fighting against modernism, so to speak, or trying to not get swallowed up by 
liberalism and modernism. But instead of following Machen in his fight against modernism, they moved in a decidedly Bardian direction. So they didn't follow the modernists, but neither did they follow Machen, so to speak. They followed Bart, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And in 1967, now remember, Vatican II is 1962 to 1965, which largely could be seen as uh, the church trying to reckon with the fallout of modernism on its, on its members. In 1967, the Presbyterian Church in the USA adopted an updated confession that many people recognize as a capitulation to the theology of Karl Barth. And in that view, the incarnation is eternal, and the scriptures are not the word of God in themselves, so to speak. I'll let you speak about that, Jim. But uh, Van Til has a whole book on this, a smaller book, but a, a book on the confession of 67. And I think his conclusions are sound. This is not an improvement. Uh, many people thought it was shoring up the church's confession in the face of modernism and that it, things were better off. But uh, in other ways, they sold the farm. And uh, in large measure became Bardian as a result. And in some respects, yeah. I mean, the the Confession of 67 is just one of many other confessional documents that the PCUSA puts in sort of a museum box of confessions that you can sort of you Yeah, know, they collect them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, collect them. And, you know... Are, are these, these are historical or, documents that describe somebody's belief back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's like going into the Princeton Seminary Library, right? And you got you got all these portraits, and you've got uh, Hodges' cane, or you know whatever uh, that he got from Hawaii somewhere. I don't know, um, but anyway, the uh, the the whole the whole thing about the Book of Confessions is that it really is a it really is a display box of just you know confessions that have sort of tangentially fallen uh, within to one degree or another, the reformed and Presbyterian tradition. Uh, you don't have to subscribe them. You don't have to believe them. You can interpret them any way you want. They have no teeth. They, there's no, you know, they, it's just a, a collection. So the confession of 1967 gets thrown into the lot as sort of just a, another reformed confession that for your information, FYI only, uh, and you can read the 1967 committee. You could agree with it, disagree with it. It doesn't really matter. And I would say that the PC USA has as many non-Bardians in, in her course. in her midst as as they do Bardians. If I don't know what the percentage would be on how they figure that stuff out, but uh, you have within the PC USA, even within Westminster, with ah, I keep saying that, even within Princeton Seminary itself you have among faculty members a number of very spirited debates uh, about Bart and his theology, you know, pro or con, or how do we interpret it, et cetera. So the PCUSA is as all over the map as, as any others. Um, the, I had heard this uh, Camden. I don't know if this is true or not, but, but there was, I I've heard that there was hope in the 1960s when the, when the confession of 67 was coming down the the pike and part of the reason why van Til wrote his book on the confession of 1967 was in the hopes that that there would be a a a, a, a sudden influx yeah within the opc of of refugees from the pc usa where guys in the OPC can, you know, point to the 67. See, see, look, that's, we told you this is where this is going. And now finally they've denied scripture and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it just didn't happen. Uh, the, 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 the windfall just never arrived in the OPC of refugees from the PC USA on that. So I, I don't have the documentation for that, but I've been taught that I've heard that myself. So I don't know if that's true. I can't prove to or point to sources at, at this precise moment. So I don't want to overplay my hand of no cards <laughs> or at least vague memories, but I have vague memories uh, as well. So this might be the case where you speculated something someday, then I heard you speculate it, and now you're bringing this up and I'm reinforcing your original speculation or vice versa. So we might be reinforcing each we're, other. <laughs> we're an echo chamber of two. <laughs> exactly. How wonderful. But uh, 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 that's certainly been on my mind. And uh, I think there was an intent in why Van Til wrote what he did. Otherwise, why why bother? Why care? There were, there were still many conservatives 
um, in the PCUSA in 1967. And, uh, you know, there, there would have been thought, perhaps, that, that some would have come back. By then, they had merged with the United Presbyterian Church and had become the UPC USA. That was the church into which I was born uh, and existed for three years until that church once again merged with the PCUS to form the present-day PCUSA. So I, I don't – that's certainly plausible. I, I, I think it's more than plausible. It seems to be – to make lots of sense, but I don't have the documentation for it. But just as I mentioned, or at least uh, speculated – that what is the sine qua non of a Roman Catholic? It seems to be official, visible fellowship with the Bishop of Rome. You know, in many ways, there's kind of like, what is it that makes uh, a mainline Presbyterian a mainline Presbyterian? It, at, at the end of the day, sometimes it's evangelicalism or big tentism wins out over confessional identity. And it's just a different ethos, a different mentality. Where as long as the church body I'm in doesn't tell me I can't believe as a conservative. So as long as I'm allowed to have my conservative beliefs in this larger body, even if I'm fellowshipping with, you know, modernists <laughs> who deny the bodily resurrection of Christ, they'll put up with it if it means that they're part of a larger church, a larger visible church, a larger platform with potentially greater evangel uh, evangelistic witness, cultural influence, all of these things. And I really do think that this is something that needs to be developed. I don't know who it is to do it, um, you know, but but these are some of the themes that Charlie Dennison uh, wrote about and which have been collected in in the uh, his collection of essays in History for a Pilgrim People, edited by Danny Olinger and David Thompson. I hope to get that reprinted uh, sometime soon, but... The OPC doesn't have that have that genetic constitution. We don't have that makeup. Now, certainly some people, you know, might tend toward that way uh, or they're in the OPC for other reasons. Maybe it's just the conservative church that's near them, but whatever. But at least in terms of den denominational identity and historic identity, you know, from leading up to 36 and then beyond, it's a it's a pilgrim people. It's a pilgrim church that is much more concerned with confessional fidelity, even at the expense of cultural influence and evangelistic witness by numbers alone, we will gladly throw those things to the side if it means that we get to retain our confessional fidelity. You know, that it's just a different makeup. Now, maybe I'm, maybe I'm whitewashing things, but what do you think about this? To me, it seems, why wouldn't, here's the, to get back to your original question, why didn't the church receive an influx of ministers, ministerial members, and churches post-1967. My, my thesis, my hypothesis here is that even though they might have been sympathetic confessionally, they have a different, more basic commitment to the larger, more influential, visible church. That's, I think that, I think that's why. I don't know. What do you think of that hypothesis? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I can neither confirm nor deny that hypothesis in part because I just don't have the, the research or the expertise to substantiate that. But I will say this, that that mindset, okay, is, is oh boy, I got to be careful here. That mindset is maybe a relation of some sort, maybe a, a kissing cousin of of the very modernism of which they protest against which they protest because sure if you think about it right you know and i i've i've sort of made this argument before uh you know on the spirit of schleiermacher right as as you think about and this is why i asked you that question before about the broadening idea i mean when when you when you go back to Schleiermacher, right, what's going on there? Uh, why is he the father of liberalism? The reason why he's the father of liberalism is because he wants to recast doctrine in a similar way in which Kant would recast Christian doctrine. Uh, he wants to recast Christian doctrine in such a way that it becomes plausible to a modern world, right? He wants to answer Christianity's culture despisers, right? The ones who are saying, 
oh, that's an old time religion. Uh, that is, that has no bearing on modern life whatsoever. And Schleiermacher kind of in a, a moment of growing nervous that maybe Christianity is losing its, its dominance and grip on Western civilization and culture um, says, oh, wait, 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 wait. We're, we're going to recast Christian doctrine to make it acceptable to you and to more people uh, to, to make it more palatable to a modern world for the sake of saving our churches um, so that we can maintain that, you know, larger presence in the culture, presence, platform, whatever, within the culture. And so when you come to liberalism in Machen's day, part of the driving force to all this is not sort of just philosophical pre-commitments or uh, brainwashed by modern oh, society right. or For something sure. like that. Yeah, I mean, there's a there there's a there's a desire for the church to remain. I mean, there's always been a competitiveness within Protestant churches here in America, anyway, right? I mean, everybody, you know, going back to the time of the frontiers, and you know, the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Methodists are all vying for the numbers, and everybody's obsessed with whose church is bigger, and um, and so is there a going, fantasy league for this? There should be right, like a yeah. draft draft kings or ESPN mainline yeah. churches. I'm going to draft a church and see see how many members it gets, how, how many, many times it's gets, mentioned in many, the paper yeah. and on cable news. <laughs> see how many points you get at the end of every week. You get ten and, points yeah. for a Tucker Carlson a mention. You get <laughs> <laughs> if, if you if you could read your name in the newspaper the next yeah. day. Right. Yeah, especially the Wall Street Journal. Hundred points if a celebrity there. joins your church. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, you get that's right. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so there's this there, there's this whole thing going on of wanting to broaden the church. Why? Um, you you want to you want to keep the numbers so that you maintain your platform, right? And that's that's not just a mentality of liberal theology, right? But that's also very much the mentality of the more squishy middle evangelical um kind of approach as well. So so again, I can't substantiate your claim with hard, sure. cold facts, but my no, I can't theory either. runs similar. So I said it's either. a hypothesis. This is just a research question. In my notes, uh, this is what I would tag, you know, hashtag research question so I could search back and see. It's just a thought, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, if anyone I mean, has so, some ideas on that, write in and and uh, we'll follow up and see if we can if we can either, you know, substantiate or disqualify this hypothesis. Yeah. See, if I could just say this, I mean, when when you when you think about this, right, the spirit of Schleiermacher haunts not just the halls of the PCUSA or Princeton Seminary, right, but it's it's haunting our own very halls, right? Whether we're talking about, you know, I'm speaking here more generally of the church in America and seminaries in America. I mean, it's the spirit that needs to be constantly exercised. Uh, within our uh, within our our ranks, because it's in our heart. The spirit of Schleiermacher haunts our hearts. We want that that prominence, that pride, that that big church, that that broad church that can have numbers about which we can boast and all of that. So anyway, that's just um, my final. Parting. Well, this is another thing, you know, another question or thread I'd like to follow up regarding my Stonehouse reading, because Stonehouse, where I currently am in 1937, part of my brain is living in 1937 right now. He's interacting, you know, the World Council, interacting with and responding to movements such as these broad church union movements, like with the World Council of Churches and others. And and there's this confusion uh, or this equation of visible church unity with ecumenicity and with effectiveness or even with biblical fidelity. It's the presumption that, you know, at the bare minimum, we have to be governmentally related in order to obey the Lord, according to, you know, unity and, and uh, truth. But this, I think, is a false dichotomy. Uh, you know, the Lord says, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. There's always a presupposition that church unity is also, is also predicated upon truth, doctrine correct belief, you know, and uh, you can't compromise that just for visible unity um, and 
as important as the visible church is, the visible church is not the be-all, end-all. The visible the church includes goats. Sorry. Uh, but And that's just going to be the case until the Lord returns and purifies his church entirely. So that's a, an episode for another day. I'd love to do one on a reformed, a, a thorough, robust, reformed doctrine of ecumenicity. What does that look like and how does it work? Well, that's, a, that's one for another day. But we've gone on uh, plenty long, I think. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed some or most of this discussion. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, want to follow up, Perhaps the best way to do that is by uh, emailing us at mail at reformedforum.org, but we're also available on Twitter at Reformed Forum, or uh, Jim's at, at JJ Cassidy, and I'm at Camden Busey. We can check in on that if you got a comment uh, or remark. And, and stay tuned uh, to the email subscription list. We just announced uh, we're now selling USB thumb drives that have a prepackaged course on them, Lane's course on Foundations of Covenant Theology is available. Uh, and you can get the companion books in a bulk pack of 10, all a great deal. So if you're not subscribed to the email, you did not get that news in your inbox, subscribe now and you'll get news about forthcoming books. There are a couple coming very soon. And Jim's course on the Westminster Shorter Catechism coming up. It's a next on deck in the editing bay. So we'll get to that soon, just after Lane's course on Eden with Christ is translated and released. Should be in the next week or two. But anyway, thanks so much for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.